Um, so this is, uh, this is a farm that we called Fairfield North. So it's an irrigated uh, site. And uh, basically you have a, a series of different uh, activities going on here. Behind you is the agronomy site uh, for my program. And then we have plant breeding um, sites to the, uh, to the east and to the south. Um, and a little bit more agronomy and breeding and quite a bit of adaptation work where I do the adaptation work uh, on behalf of some of the breeders that are located at other uh, um, of our centers. Okay, so what we're going to talk today about is um, within the realm of winter wheat, sort of where we've been progressing. Um, it's been 15 years since I started my first winter wheat experiment. And so we started with things like sort of uh, retweaking the whole system, starting with the seeding system and understanding weed competitive ability and things like that. And so we've got that sort of locked down as far as what our optimum seeding rate should be, that 450 seeds per meter squared. Uh, we've looked at seed treatments and how effective they can be with winter wheat. We talked about that last week. Um, and so the next phase that I saw is, is focusing more on um, the photosynthetic machine of, of winter wheat. And so this is what these series of experiments are, are trying to focus on. Starting with, of course, nitrogen, which is, you know, our number one limiting factor when it comes to crop production in general. And, uh, but it's also very important as far as uh, developing that canopy in a, in a manner in which it sinks best to the environment in which that crop's being grown. Um, the second aspect of nitrogen these days and why we're very interested in it is most of these are looking at uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizers. And uh, we're, we're sort of, I think, at an important point with enhanced efficiency fertilizers because we know there's an environmental benefit there as far as mitigating losses, uh, but we're still trying to wrap our heads around the economic benefits. And, uh, and you can judge for yourself as we move along um, where you think they fit in a winter wheat system. Um, so what we're going to start with is uh, this test here. And this plot here I love. You know why I love that plot? Because it's the control and it has no nitrogen. And if that thing was looking good, it would tell us we've got too much background in here and our results aren't going to be so hot. Um, so basically this is a trial where um, we are looking at those enhanced efficiency fertilizers in various timings and applications using uh, the latest release from our program uh, here at Lethbridge run by Dr. Robert Graff, and that's uh, Flourish. So starting with the control. So let's go for a walk. Okay, so the next real controller check in any fertilizer study looking at enhanced efficiency fertilizers is regular old urea. And uh, granular urea was one of those things, especially in a top dress situation where when we lost ammonium nitrate as that go-to form for top dressing, it was like, well, we can't top dress anymore. We're going to lose all this urea when we top dress. And the fact is, those losses aren't as apparent as, as, the, as they were predicted to be. And urea can be tough to beat um, when you're looking at uh, benefits solely around using proxies like yield to compare urea to enhanced efficiency fertilizers. Um, the other aspect, of course, is the, is the timing of those applications. So in this situation, we're putting 30% at planting and then 70% at either in the spring or late fall. And so you'll see various iterations of that as we, as we walk down. So you can have a look, keep these two as your reference, and then we'll start looking at different, uh, different forms as we go along. Where's uh, Steven? Yeah. So Steven, put up your hand. This is Steven Simmel. He's uh, uh, one of the technicians looking after the winter wheat agronomy. Warren Taylor behind him, uh, other technician. And our other technician is in Hawaii, Ryan Dick. So uh, Danielle, put your hand up. She's one of our uh, casual uh, GLs, uh, laborers working for us. So And Charles, where are you? Charles. He is, uh, he's a French intern coming to us from a farm in France and, a, and an institute there where they, we have a nice exchange program. So he's working on the growth regulators that we're going to look at as well. So how much N did you put on? Um, Steven, yeah. do you know that off the top of your head what the N dose was? We're, well, basically, we're targeting. Uh, what was the target again on this one? Yeah, something like what? 
what we're going for um, is we'll, we'll, we'll usually with some of these tests shoot for about 80% of optimum. And the reason for that is in a nitrogen test, if you go too high, it starts to mask the differences. And so, and so you got to watch it when you're reading reports around nitrogen reports and the yield associated with it, making sure that they were pushing free nitrogen or not. We'll look at another test further on where we set it at about 150. That's kind of what I like to see is about 150 to 170 pounds, whether that's soil and plus amended is sort of what you're shooting for for winter wheat. It's got a very long growth duration in the vegetative uh, phase and it needs more nitrogen to build up that photosynthetic machine over spring wheat. One of the uh, products we're looking at is, um, and we've done a lot of work and published a lot of papers on, is uh, ESN by uh, Agrium, um, environmentally smart nitrogen they call it. This isn't a product that we would recommend for top dressing. Um, it actually can work effectively, um, but the reason it sometimes will work effectively in a top dress situation is because you're actually cracking the polymer coating on it. And that's really not what you want to be doing anyway, because you're sort of losing the value of it. The, the value in ESN up here in, in, uh, in the northern Great Plains is uh, for where you have very little seed separation between your nitrogen and your seed at planting. That is the only product that can give you the kind of safety that you need in those sorts of situations. And you can put all of your fertilizer needs down in the seed row if you were single shooting using ESN and you'd be done and without any concern over, over uh, toxicity effects to your, to your plant. So it's, it's very good for that. The top dressing aspect of ESN is more applicable in the corn belt. Um, uh, and, and so for the other sort of use that we see that's possibly a value for ESN here, if you are in a more modernized system of, of seed placement at, at seeding, is sometimes you can go with a, if you want to get a little bit slower release with your nitrogen that you're putting down at planting, is you can run with a blend of about 50% urea, 50% ESN banded to the side. And, and there, is, there is a slight yield bump you can get from that um, over just plain urea. Any questions on that? Does that cause issues in the dry spring, like we had though? Because it at least gets up 50% available. But then the ESN needs that water to break down. So it would have got it later on in the season. Well, that's kind of what you're shooting for. You know, you're shooting for some to be available right away. Right. And then when the conditions, if they occur, are amenable to later release to sort of give you either a yield or a protein bump later on, then you've got the ESN. It's sort of a, you're sort of, you're sort of managing your risk for uh, both loss and optimum or less optimum timing of, of available end by having both because you will get a stratified release But this phase. year probably would have leaned more protein rather than ELA. Well, we'll see, we'll see. That's why we need to replicate over time and space, right? Especially with nitrogen trials. Um, so yeah, good question. Zero till starts on the combine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you are familiar with, um, you've probably heard of Agrotain, um, a urease inhibitor, which is a very nice product for any type of top dressing um, applications in, uh, in, any, in, in a range of crops. Um, the same company is, has now come out with a, um, a product called Super U. So basically it's a urease inhibitor combined with the DCD um, uh, component to it. So it's trying to, it, you, you're, go, you're sort of get, getting a, uh, a, a double um, package of, of limiting losses. And, and we've done quite a bit of work on it and um, it actually looks quite good. And it was, um, if you look at the various treatments, sometimes it's apparent and sometimes it's not, but um, when it comes to split applications, there's farmers, particularly um, in the eastern prairies, that would prefer to go out 
and put that second application very late in fall because it's too wet in the spring. That's if they logistically or for whatever reason don't want to put all their nitrogen down at planting. That was always um, um, discouraged uh, based on the scientific evidence that the losses were extreme with a late fall application of nitrogen. Typically these guys were going on right on snow or just before snow um, and with a product like urea or any of the other products, whether it's liquid, agritain, um, ESN, the losses are all the same. However, um, in a study that we just finished up a few years ago, Super U was the only product that was able to maintain yield, um, even putting that product down in a, at, a, at a timing that we would typically discourage. So um, very nice product there. Again, uh, on the economic side, I think it's the, we still don't know yet, but uh, as far as it being a really good enhanced efficiency fertilizer for the prairies of Canada, it, it's right up there. And so um, both it and Agritain are now under uh, the company Coke Agronomic Services. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, I think what you're referring to is mainly in potato production, though, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I'm going to say we don't want to fertilize for it. Yeah. I'm afraid to cut off the yep. Like yep. And that, that could change if uh, products like that come into the marketplace and, and there's a lot of uptake because that's that's a different story for sure. One product that we're looking at for the first time that's not really anything new. Um, it was a it was it was readily available in the states for quite a while, but um, it's a it's similar to Super U, um, and it's a uh, it's a product called Instinct that's uh, marketed by Dow AgroSciences. Um, and so this is one we haven't looked at before, but we've linked in with uh, Dow AgroSciences. They were interested, and so. Uh, um, uh, It'll be interesting to see how Instinct does relative to Super U, but um, based on the preliminary data, um, it looks pretty good as well. So we'll see what happens. Um, we've 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 conducted and and a lot of other agronomists and programs have done a lot of work on granular fertilizer and how that those responses work in various wheat systems. Um, liquids a little bit different. Um, and so uh, this test is just sort of a, a, a continuation of what we just uh, went past. Those were all granular forms. Now we're looking at um, some liquid forms here. And, and one of the big reasons for that is um, UAN on its own with no stabilizers is a bit of a disaster at times. And it certainly was in the previous study where we had it. Um, anything that was prone to losses was related to a UAN um, that, w that didn't have a stabilized form. So we're looking at stabilized forms here, comparing again to uh, um, uh, regular urea, but also to uh, ESN as well. And this one is basically just 50% plied at planting and 50% in uh, the rest in, uh, in spring. And so two Agritain products packaged with the UAN. Um, one is a regular urease inhibitor and the other one is sort of is sort of a liquid form of the super U that we saw back there. Um, and I just got those backwards again. Where's Steven? What what what's ultra again? Uh, ultra is the liquid and it has one inhibitor in it. Yeah that's the urease inhibitor. And so plus has got is the granular that goes in and it's uh, it's it's the uh, urease plus the D C D. No, it would be, it would be, uh, it's not in the seed row though. With the conserva pack, it's no, the seed to, yeah, this time of seeding is at planting. Or the time of application of the 50% is at planting. Off to the side. If I could screw that up any worse though. <laughs> I'm sure I will further down, but, but no, nothing seed placed. Okay, so here's the check. Um, just plain old UAN here is what we're sort of look comparing things to. And so um, you'll see why we need lots of replication over time and space to, and getting the right situation for losses. Frankly, last year, um, there was really 
no environmental conditions that really put us at risk to losses. So we're kind of hoping this year uh, we're going to see a little bit more of that because um, it's hard to evaluate that. I wanted to ask a dry land production question, if you don't mind, yep. before you start this one. So the split app side of things, to me, kind of makes more sense on a dry land situation for a spring application. So a guy gets to know whether there's good spring moisture and might want to top up. In that type of scenario, what do you think is the best product and application method? Um, well, the first thing is that, I mean, there was a time when people thought that split applications, you would suffer a yield penalty. And we definitely dispelled that myth um, in, in both spring and winter wheat. So, so split applications aren't a bad thing. In Europe, they'll split two, three times um, in spring wheat, um, Durham, uh, for example. Um, so some at planting and then some again at, uh, at a certain growth stage in the spring is, is fine. Um, the only thing that you have to watch is not being too late with it because you will lose a benefit to yield. Um, and then you're just putting it down to partition that, that second application into protein. And that's, that may or may not be a, a wise move. Um, so as far as product goes, um, you know, you can sort of gauge it and see based on the weather. Um, but if you're concerned about loss, depending on the environmental conditions you're in or the type of system you're in, um, you know, given the uh, fairly modest cost increase, I would, I would consider it a, a bit of an insurance package to go with some sort of enhanced efficiency, even like an agritain um, granular would be, would be something. The, um, another nice way I think would be, um, I definitely, and, and uh, um, we don't have as much data to support that part of it, but if you were going to go with a liquid form, I think, I think you'd be crazy not to have an enhanced efficiency stabilizer in that because you know, you get a warm, windy day uh, like today, if you were putting any sort of UAN down, um, you are exposing yourself to a very high probability of loss. So, um, you know, you can cheat a little bit on the granular side. You know, if you've got rain coming and it's a fairly cool day, um, you wouldn't necessarily need an enhanced efficiency fertilizer per se, but I wouldn't say the same with a UAN. Too much could happen where you could lose that to leaching pretty fast or volatilize up into the air real fast. So, so you'd be more concerned with UAN than you would straight urea? I think so, yeah. Even though half of it's nitrate, or 25% yeah. nitrate, 25% ammonia. Yeah, I would. Urea. I would. Depending on the application method, if you're, if you're just dribble banding the UAN very close to the ground, maybe that's a different scenario. But if you're blowing it down with any kind of streamer jet nozzle on a warm, windy day, um, I'd be real careful about that. And, and, and we've done a lot of that kind of work with winter wheat and UAN always dragged its rear end behind any of the other forms, including granular urea and any of the split applications we've done with winter wheat. What about fertigation? I think that'd be even worse. But I haven't looked at it. I mean, you're up higher, yeah. um, it's misting a bit, um, warm, hot weather, a little bit of wind. I mean, that's just perfect for volatilization. So, so Brian, you're saying that urea is concerned with urea being present, or, or does it have to convert to ammonia first? Or? Yeah, I mean, it would have to convert first, but you're, you're not as stable to start with with a UAN product as you are with, uh, with a urea granular, well, I don't there, think. There is a process in terms of you know, the converting over, so it should be stable for the first short time after when you're fertigating, you know, what would be your risk in terms of... Yeah, and you might, be, you might be the better one to speak to that because I don't have any experience with that, but... Yeah, you'd be more concerned about what's happening when it's converting from urea to the ammonia, right? To Except that there is 25% yeah. that is already ammonia in UAN, right? So that's probably the part that you're losing. That's the immediate part, yeah. yeah. That's sort of what we're talking about yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but normally, and and there's some, uh, if you've seen any of the tweets or um, 
Some of the, uh, in some of my presentations showing slides that Dr. Regis Karamanos talked about as far as um, uh, some of the, the when and where of when these enhanced efficiency fertilizers are a benefit is uh, the old idea where you can, um, you know, get your fertilizer down, whether or not you're direct seeding it with your, at planting or, or um, uh, banding or applying, broadcast and incorporating, those types of systems are actually, you're losing more than you think. Um, we always thought you need to get that fertilizer in and covered, um, not sitting on top. And, and the fact is, um, just the way things are evolving with our zero till systems, we're exposing ourselves to greater losses than we think. And NH3 is one of those examples. Uh, there's some pretty interesting results um, that have been published now on um, losses from, you know, that shallow banding. And you actually have to go quite deep. Um, um, so losses are more apparent. And it's just something, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, if you're not seeing it, um, you don't think it's happening necessarily to the degree that it might be on your farm. The in crop canopy thing, and it actually goes back to some work that was done by Jensen 20 years ago, 20 years ago now. They looked at, looked at some of the ammonia that, that is lost in your system here in the some canopy the work that they did actually when they turn back into canopy. They think so. That's always one of the questions that sort of comes up is where soil versus where you got where you're going in timing something say at the first stage 30 yeah. 32 is is some of that being reaffirmed and it's it's really hard to sort that out in the research but there, there was actually some really good stuff that was done 20 years ago by Henry Jansen here in the by here. And they actually found that a lot of it was being reaffirmed in that canopy. So that's kind of a, a good news scenario for the later time. Yeah and I think I think that I think that that speaks to some of the work that um, that Regus had summarized uh, based on a few other studies where, you know, that split application and the benefit of it in crop and, and the reasons for it probably relate back to those losses on, on or even if you think you're shallow incorporating into bare soil where you think you won't have any losses isn't necessarily the case. And so it speaks to, it speaks to the splits and we're definitely seeing um, as good or better results with the splits that we have here when we put, you know, maybe 30% um, down at planting and the rest, the rest in the spring at various phases. Oh, sorry, I guess I should talk about this experiment before I keep walking here. We're still on nitrogen. Um, okay, so now we're moving to the next part of this where we're looking at canopy development and uh, lots of interest in plant growth regulators. Um, so uh, we're collaborating with um, um, Dr. Linda Hall. She's doing a bunch of growth regulator work on, on some spring cereals and we're doing some on uh, winter cereals here. And so what we've got here is we've got three different varieties. We've got a super tall uh, fall rye hazelet here, which if we're, gonna see a, if we're going to see something happening with a growth regulator, it should be with a fall rye as tall as it is, right? If we think growth regulators have a big effect on height. Right? Um, then we're comparing, and I thought it would, might be interesting to go to the other extreme and go with a semi-dwarf flourish um, and see, it might, and it might not even be a true semi-dwarf carrying the RHT gene or not, but the fact is it's very short. What does that do when you apply it with a growth regulator? And then the reason we wanted to do it was when moats first came out, which is a fairly recent winter wheat variety, it kind of pancaked on a lot of the seed producers that were blowing it up for uh, commercial sales so on irrigation and so where do PGRs fit in that scenario um, rather than look at a range of different products um, our focus was on Trinexapac ethyl and we linked in with Syngenta because they were the ones coming out probably first with the product that would be available for winter wheat growers and so basically what we wanted to do was look at that and sort of help them with this data um, support that registration phase of it and so what we've done is uh, two doses, uh, 0.6x uh, or a full 1x rate. And we applied that at either uh, sort of a late tillering phase or we waited a little bit longer until that crop was in a pre-boot phase. 
the, the nice part about a Trinexapac ethyl is got a, it's got a wider window of forgiveness as far as when you apply it and, and uh, the expected responses you'll, you'll get from it. Um, now, as far as expected responses, would we have a massive apparent reduction in height with a growth regulator? Yes or no? Hector. Not necessarily. Wow, there's a political answer. So when I first started this study, I thought, okay, you know, we, we, we see a lot of the pictures on the internet about these massive reductions in, in height. Uh, so, so the benefit then must be um, you apply a growth regulator to a plant that's perhaps prone to lodging. Now it shortens up, it's stronger, and any resulting uh, losses because of lodging or losses because of crop quality from lodging, um, you've now mitigated and you've protected that yield. Um, the fact is we've now got quite a bit of data. All these experiments are typically growing across the prairies. And uh, what's interesting is you get a very modest reduction in height. Um, the other expectation was that it would go down in height and the stems would um, thicken or widen um, quite apparently. Um, and in fact, after, I don't know, what are we up to, about seven sight years now? While there is a, uh, a modest, trend towards a, a, a wider diameter with the application of a PGR, the fact is it's not significant. What's interesting though is thus far, and you see it today and you'll see it probably later on in the year, we're putting lots of nitrogen to this, we're trying to make this particular test go down because we're on irrigation and, and we haven't been able to. So we haven't had, Ken's got a site as well, we haven't been able to actually have any significant lodging and so I thought well we're not going to have any any real benefit here. And the fact is there's a significant benefit to yield even in the absence of lodging. And what I think is happening is we don't get these, these, um, these real significant changes um, to the actual morphology of the plant. Um, what I think is happening is that that growth regulator is just creating changes within the plant structure in a way where those resources that may have once been partitioned to something in a vegetative state are now being partitioned up into grain. Whether or not you have lodging or not, and whether or not you see massive reductions in yield. In fact, the less changes to the morphological features probably means those resources are being saved and being pumped up into something else rather than building or changing that stem structure, which is a good thing. And so the other kind of interesting thing was I told the guys, okay, when we analyze the data, we'll delete flourish because it's so short it's probably interfering with any chance to see anything in relation to yield or some of these other features we're looking at because Charles is in the process of doing his report for France. We pull out Flourish and actually it, it, it weakens the yield um, significance. So even with something as short as Flourish, something's happening with that PGR where there's a positive response in terms of yield. So, so pretty interesting results around the PGR. And again, it's one of those things like enhanced efficiency fertilizers, do we, have, um, do we have that economic differential that is enticing to producers to make that change? And, and of course, all, all, in the, all sort of in the context of whether or not MRLs are gonna be a worry for a producer that's applying this. So, so that's kind of the, the lowdown on, um, on PGRs. Any questions? I think I'm about out of time. Yeah. Are there any marking restrictions to use PGR? Well, only in the only in the context of making sure that you don't have uh, any detectable MRLs in it, because that I heard with manipulator, that's a continuing concern this year again as well. Um, so the best thing to do is talk to who you typically market that grain through, and that they're going to be okay with with taking delivery of something that's at some point received it well ahead of going out and doing it.